If you look at uh, the actual azimuth distribution that you get with these streamers, you know, and some of these geometries are very complex, um, the one thing that geophysical algorithms like <coughs> is consistency. And what we don't really have in either of these uh, azimuth distributions from the, uh, the MAS or the WATS is actually very regularly sampled and uniformly sampled azimuth distribution. So I think we can do much better than this, although the results are very, very impressive and very, very encouraging. Uh, if we really want to try and squeeze that 1% out that Gunnar Berger talked about, then I think we're going to have to do better than these kind of uh, azimuth distributions. And using ocean bottom data, you can actually achieve what Heist Vermeer would call a, a perfect survey, a, a truly symmetrically sampled survey. Uh, in fact, uh, this is how we shot some data offshore Kazakhstan last year, and uh, unfortunately I can't show the results, all I can say is that the, the, the brute stacks coming off the vessel were better, better than the two-year reprocessing of the previous generation of data. But what you can do, and it comes, it comes at a price, this is the receiver app, this is the receiver grid, and this is 400-fold um, <coughs> symmetrically sampled data in 12.5 meter by 12.5 meter bins, uh, but you do get a complete azimuth distribution and a uniform azimuth distribution. This is an ex example of data comparing wide azimuth toad streamer, uh, multi-azimuth toad streamer with wide azimuth LBC that Total presented last year at the uh, EAG. And uh, <coughs> the comment in the text was that the uh, OBC data gave a better definition of the pre-Jurassic of deeper pre-Jurassic gives more input to structural understanding of the print levels, which I think is geology means saying it's better. Um, but you can see from the seismic data, this is the this is three parts multi-azimuth uh, compared with the wide azimuth OBC, and it is much, much more uh, rich in information, it has better structural definition, it has better signal to noise ratio. So uh, we actually see much, much clearer uh, resolution of the faulting uh, at the reservoir level with the OBC data than we do with multi azimuth toe streamer. And this was the first time I'd seen a comparison between multi azimuth toe streamer and full azimuth OBC. Uh, just looking at some of the, uh, the multi azimuth examples in the Gulf of Mexico, I, I agree uh, with the first speaker's comments that we will see this exported uh, elsewhere in the world because there are basalt challenges, salt challenges uh, elsewhere. Um, if you look at the actual subsalt wells in the Gulf of Mexico and look at the, the early successful discoveries shown here in red, and this is basically the, the edge of the, uh, the shelf, you see where a lot, of the, a lot of the discoveries were actually on the shelf uh, and then some more in the deeper water uh, here. If you look at where these wide azimuth, wide aperture tow streamer surveys have been conducted, Mississippi Canyon, Green Canyon, Garden Banks. You know, why are people looking at these other discoveries up in here with the same technology? And then you look at the infrastructure that's in place. And there's just no way that you can get in there with these very complex, very sophisticated uh, toe streamer configurations that the first speaker showed uh, into these kind of producing areas. So we actually think there's going to be quite a lot more wide as of the data acquired uh, on the shelf subsoil in the Gulf of Mexico going forward. So, right, looking at data asked about costs, and this sort of normalized costs, and, and basically what we're looking at is OBC, comparing OEC with white azimuth. And, um, we actually didn't do this. This was uh, uh, GX technology. I am geophysical actually prepared this slide that allowed us to use it. Uh, so this is where we see OBC today. Looking at uh, comparing it with the conventional narrow, I'm going to show you conventional narrow as a stream running one tile, two tile, three tiles. Every time it tiles, every time you offset the uh, source vessels from the uh, streamer vessel to, to build up cross line coverage or cross line offset. And so the different survey sizes. And so basically, if you look at narrow azimuth and try to do the same thing, uh, you end up with, with, with a 150 square kilometer survey. It ends up being, it being prohibitively expensive. Uh, as you get to larger and larger survey sizes, which is typically what we've used before, the, the cost comes down. Um, and you see that uh, if you get around two, three thousand square kilometers, you, 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 you're really able to provide a, you know, quite a, 
uh, good value for money. Uh, I know this answers the question that was about how much the land has. It gives you some sort of ratio. Um, but what we actually see is that, uh, and, and so we end, we end up here for very large scale surveys with, with, with costs that are, that, are, that are very, very competitive um, between OBC and uh, uh, wide asthma and streamer. But what we see in the future is that OBC costs are going to come down further as the technology improves. Just like Dave mentioned PGS, we put more streamers out. And uh, that was able to reduce the, the, the actual square kilometer rate down because it was more square kilometers per parts of the vessel. And with larger and larger OBC spreads, which is the kind of thing that the boy based technology we believe is the right way to go, uh, will allow us to do. We are actually going to be more competitive for some of these wide hats on the geometries, even if you don't factor in the, the access problems or logistical access problems uh, than uh, toast stream solutions. So that's that's. That's where we believe some of this uh, one hasn't been. And then we're also, people like to look deeper. Uh, I put this up because it's kind of cute. Um, this is, we, we, we did some work in the Gulf of Mexico, as a data example uh, I showed you earlier. And we also recorded some 30 second records because we were actually looking at quite deep and wanted to look at the shear waves quite deep. And so this is a 30 second record with a 10 hertz high cup applied. And this is actually 30 seconds. So this is, in fact, yes, this is 22 seconds down in here. And uh, 20 seconds, somewhere up in here, according to, we don't have much velocity control down here. <laughs> and we didn't shoot an orthogonal line, unfortunately, which would have been really interesting, because we couldn't, because we were too close to the coast. Um, but the textbooks say the moho should be in here somewhere, we think. <coughs> and there's a lot of debate amongst the geologists about what exactly we see, is it real, is it sheer, it's, we don't know, but it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. The reason we see it is because we're actually looking, this is 10 hertz here, we're actually looking down in this region down here. Uh, so conventional streamers, even with the filters out, tend to cut off historically. This was the, the Syntrack streamer that used to be fairly standard in the industry a few years ago. Conventional data tends to roll off and be 10, 15 dB down by the time you get to 2 or 3 hertz, where most of this energy actually is. So just food for thought as we look deeper and deeper into things. And also very good for inversion. Right. Uh, integration with EM, last couple of minutes. Uh, I actually think this is going to be a real, uh, let's say, dual and crown going forward. The um, seismic, uh, basically, uh, based on acoustic or elastic waves, as you all know. Conventional closed stream of purely acoustic, uh, acoustic map structures. In certain circumstances, the elastic can help identify fluid content. Uh, EM, it's based on electromagnetic waves. Uh, it's the diffusion equation, it's of Maxwell down towards DC. Uh, and it can, in the right circumstances, because hydrocarbons are much more resistive than uh, water, actually discriminate between a, uh, a water filled uh, body and a uh, oil or hydrocarbon, a gas oil, because of the resistivity contrast. And it basically works because the arrivals come back into the sensors on the seabed before the short circuit arrives. But that's when we talk about that over lunch. Um, we actually think that uh, a high resolution EM system, and for high resolution, I mean with the sensor spacing much closer than the EM systems that have been used before, so far, for, for this. Uh, Control source EM, in combination in combination with ocean bottom cable sizing, will actually provide a unique combination for reservoir appraisal and development. And so, what we are doing, what we're building, this is the sales pitch now, is that we're actually this is how we shoot uh, ocean bottom cable data. We have a shooting boat, and we lay out a number of buoys, uh, typically now it's six or eight. Uh, we record all the data recording is remotely in the recording buoys. Uh, we're actually going to put out an EM array using exactly the same sort of recording board, and we'll put an EM source on the vessel. And it won't be contemporaneous, but it will be the same crew. If we try to fire the source off into the cable, the MEMS accelerometer we would use is okay, but the hydrocarbons will get fried by the electromagnetic pulse going into some surface. 